I, I'm Peter Leeson. I am quality manager for a company you've never heard of. I suppose. Has anyone heard of White Clark Group? Okay. Um, it's a large company, a large multinational financial software company, uh, constant growth. Look at this wonderful. I, I have to show these, okay? My marketing team told me I had to show this, so I'm showing it. Um, and after all, they're paying my salary while I'm here. So it's growing. We're still growing. It has grown quite a bit since these slides were produced. Um, if any of you are looking to find a job in England before Brexit, contact me. Um, these are our offices. These are pictures of our offices across the world. The Indian picture is not actually our offices. It's just a pretty view from India. I, um, our clients, our clients, well, we've got financial clients so, uh, of all sorts. Uh, we specialize in automotive finance. So if you buy a car from one of these people, you've probably used our software even without knowing it. It's a wonderful product, modular front office, back office, and so on. Because it's a great product, we have attracted some great customers and the company is growing. And this is a common problem because companies grow because they're developing a good product and they start hiring new people and they start changing the way things happen. And somehow the quality at some point starts dropping off. Things start going wrong because we've hired new people who don't understand the vision, who aren't sharing in the dream. And there comes a point where there is something that says, stop, we have to change, we have to get back on track. We have to get back to increasing quality. So what do we do? Well, the first thing we do, of course, is we go and see what the great gurus tell us. We go and read the books, all these wonderful books. And you read these books and you think, that's what I want. That is, that's the kind of company I would like. I understand this. I want to implement this. And then the big question is, how do I translate that theory into my reality? Because I'm not working that way. I don't have all the stuff these people are talking about. How do I do a, go about this? And suddenly reality comes in. How do we make it happen? We call in a consultant. Okay? Consultants, they come in, good consultant sees what's going wrong, analyzes your problems, understands things, makes recommendations, starts changing things around, starts making, giving talks, motivates your team, gets everybody fired up. Yes, I really want this. Yes, now I understand. Yes, let's do it. And then the consultant goes home. And suddenly reality takes over. What was he talking about? What did he mean by that? We don't have time to do all this stuff. So what's the next step? How can we? I know. Let's have an audit. Audits are good, you see. Now I have a project. I have a deadline. I have a checklist. I have things that have to do. I can assign responsibilities. I can make things happen. And what happens in an audit? Um, think about your school days. What was the question you were most likely to ask your teacher? Was it, excuse me, teacher, Will this additional bit of knowledge and wisdom facilitate my life in future, allow me to create a better world and make my loved ones happier? Or was it, excuse me, teacher, is this part of the exam? And that's what happens with the audit. The audit does not help you improve the product and the services you are delivering. 
The audit makes you focus on what it is the auditor wants and forget what it is your clients want. And so you pass the audit. Great. But nothing has changed. I know why nothing changed. Because we chose the wrong standard framework model. Let's try a different one. Okay, There are loads of them out there. Let's try a different approach and do something else. By the way, it was great just now hearing the guys from Luna reinventing the foundations of CMMI. But I'll skip on that. <laughs> this is what goes wrong once you start reading these theories and once you call in the auditors and follow the models. We often use this triangle. This triangle brings together the three key components of a quality work. People, work practices and tools. Frequently I've seen this triangle being used. More rarely have I seen it being used correctly. Which is that your work practices and your tools, your processes and your technology have to work together to support the people. It is the people who produce quality. It is the people who do the work. Great process does not do any work. Being certified ISO or any other standard does not do the work. It is the people that do the work. And these models don't focus. The questions you should be asking is, what are people? Because people are extraordinary beings. You are the unique combination of your ancestry, your DNA, of every book you have read, every film you have seen, every melody you have heard. You are the combination of everything you have eaten and drunk throughout your life. Every experience you have had has helped to form you into an absolutely unique being. And that's the problem. I can manage process, I can manage technology. How do I manage people? To make it worse, this combination brings together the most powerful computer in the world. I'll just expand that for those who are less number literate. Someone calculated that the human brain, if we were to make a computer that worked, did as much work as the human brain did, it would consume all the power of four nuclear plants just to run this one computer. Okay, This is the size of a computer which is much less efficient than your brain. And your brain has an added advantage. It comes with a practical body for carrying it around. But, like computers, there is a but. You see, your brain has got two processes. It's actually got three, but I'm not going to talk about the third one. It has got your reflex, which is very rapid, which is your instinct. We know that one. And it comes with your reflective brain, which is very power consuming and can only do one thing at the time and demands a lot of energy and reflection. Basically, your reflex brain, your type 1 processes immediately know what this is and what to do about it. Your type 2 processes, your reflective brain, is a lot more difficult. This is where you have to stop your reflex in order to put in place your reflective aspect. Well, you don't stop your reflex. It continues heart beating and things like that. But it basically means if you want to explain the political situation in Syria, you probably have to stop walking at the same time because it's getting too complex. You're driving in a crowded city with children arguing in the back. You don't know where you are. It's foggy. You tell the children to stop talking. 
so that you can focus entirely on trying to understand. Let me give you an example. Very simple test. I'm going to put a word on the screen, single word, in a collar, and I want you all to shout out what collar this word is in. Okay? Let's give this a try. Good. Night. Green. Red. Come on, shout it out. Blue. Yellow. No, blue. This is red. Green. What's 421 times 60? Green. Blue. Yellow. Blue. Green. You got it? Interesting. Interesting. As soon as I put up something that required reflection, you couldn't shout out colors anymore. It wasn't a complicated calculation. Okay? It's a fairly simple calculation. You could have done it mentally without any problems, but you have to interrupt your type 1 processes in order to focus on your type 2 processes. So what does this mean in business? So in business I'm busy doing stuff in my work, I'm busy running my work normally, I know what's going on, I'm doing and then in comes this bloody consultant who has a very simple message to me which is stop change everything, do it now. How do you feel about that? Sorry, but our customers are waiting. Our level one processes have to continue running. I can't kick in the level two processes at this point. And so what happens is that the beautiful transformation the beautiful evolution and improvement that your consultant has promised you turns out to be a complete failure. Why is this? Because your consultant comes in and he looks at things through his own understanding and like some of you are realizing right now you can't see all the black spots in your company. I cannot see all the things that are actually going wrong. And so I know your company is in trouble and I have to decide what to do about it. And I look at the big picture and I come up with my standard solution. You know what you need? You need bigger balloons. Bigger balloons will solve this. And then as I got a consultant, I go away and you try to remember what it was that I did and you replace your balloons with red balloons. And what's the result? Absolutely nothing. How do I go about when things are going wrong, how do I go about changing direction? Okay, it's a difficult task. We need to change direction. In order to change direction of any physical body, you need kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is what's keeping you moving and you need the same amount of kinetic energy to stop or change directions. So if you're going to change things, kinetic energy, there's an easy formula to remember, it's there. Number one, it's dependent on the size of your company. How big is this thing you're trying to change? 
And number two, it depends on how fast you are moving. In other words, how fast are you spinning wheels, trying to keep things running, firefighting, solving problems, and those two things will stop you from changing, from evolving. It's very nice to say, all we need to do is standardize requirements, start collecting information and so on. But in reality, it's a lot more difficult. And all these theories that go about there seem to be failing. I was told that I had to talk about quality. <laughs> I talk about quality. I am, I'm obsessed with quality. Okay. Um, very simply, whatever you are doing, whatever product you are building, whatever service you are delivering, I can find it somewhere else. You might think you've got something unique, I can find it somewhere else. And more than likely, I can find it cheaper. The world is there. If you're in the software industry, I can go anywhere. Okay, the world is wide open. At the speed of electricity over the internet, I can get my software from anywhere in the world. And by the way, you're competing against them. There are people in South Africa, in East Asia, in North America, in West Europe, who want your customer, who want your revenue, who want your job, and they don't care about you. You're far away. But quality, the quality you produce, that is unique to you. That is something special. Only you are producing this. You want to produce quality, which is so damn good that your customers won't even bother looking elsewhere. And that's the challenge you have. Because, you see, quality is not something built into your product. Quality is not something you are making. Oh, I can measure and build in reliability and portability and all these good things. But that's not what quality is. Quality is the relationship between an individual and an object. For past 20 years, I have been working as a consultant till about a year ago when I decided I was old enough to do something else with my evenings. I worked around the world. I worked very rarely in my own country. I live within easy reach of three airports. That was one of the criteria for moving where I live. I didn't have a car because my car would have spent its life sitting in airport car parks. So I didn't own a car. About a year ago, I took on a job, which is a 15-minute drive from where I live. Public transport in my town is absolutely rubbish. So my job is 15 minutes drive or two and a half hours by bus from where I live. So I had to buy a car. I have to buy a car to go from my home to my office, 15 minutes from the office back to my home, 15 minutes. Is Lamborghini quality? No. I don't want to spend that amount of money on this. I need something practical. I need something cheap. I need something that can go over speed bumps. Quality is the relationship between an individual and an object. I define it with a simple formula, which is that quality is what you produce divided by what your clients expect. The higher the expectation, the worse the quality you produce, no matter how good it is. Your perception of quality depends on where you are, who you are, what your mindset is. 
exactly the same thing from a different point of view can give a completely different feeling as to what is quality and what is not. So I'm trying to produce quality. I've gone through all this stuff. How do we go about producing quality? I did a survey in, the, in, in my company. I spoke to various people and asked them the same question. And I understood that we have got two completely different perceptions as to what is quality. In fact, the perceptions, the feeling as to what is necessary in order to produce quality is very clearly split across a simple line which I know that's not what they meant. But as I read this, I understand that quality is the responsibility of whoever I can blame if it goes wrong. If you ask the engineers, that's management's fault because management needs to give us, provide us all this stuff. If you ask managers, it's all engineering's problem. So here we have it. I cannot use the existing theories, frameworks and practices in order to change things. I need to improve quality, but I cannot do it because it depends on who I'm talking to and at what time in their life I'm doing it. And even within the company, people disagree as to what it actually means. What's next? The problem with frameworks, the problem with all these theories, is they ignore the basics and then they try to put something in underneath to make it look as if they had thought it. Okay? If you look at all these theories, rules without passion, design without art. Here I've got you great processes defined on how you need to do your job. You've got 15 years experience, you're an expert at your job, you know how to do it. You don't need processes, you're not going to follow the processes. You're going to focus on the work, you're going to be in your creative bubble, you're going to be in your zone, you're going to be focusing and following the process or not, who cares? Okay, I've got the great process, I'm not going to give it to the experienced experts, I'm going to give it to the beginners. What is the level of detail this specific beginner needs to do this specific task at this specific moment? Ah, well, let's standardize. We put in to these models rubbish measurements, okay? We put in measurements. We, we heard just now, for those who were here, about the, the problems with measuring story points and throughput and so on, and velocity, because it is a fictional measurement being used to justify a theory. Someone said to me yesterday evening that um, discussing after these presentations, you could say all the things you didn't dare say in public. There's not a lot I don't dare say in public. Okay, I'm a big supporter of Agile, but it doesn't always work. And this is one of the reasons. People today are not interested in measurements. We believe that we're talking to engineers. We believe that we're talking to people who think things through. We believe that if we present the facts and the data and the numbers and the measurements, people are going to believe us and see that this is the right way. We believe that as evangelical promoters of some theory, by presenting these data, people will believe it and so on. It's not true. Most people don't care 
about the facts and the data. They care about the emotions it gives them. And that creates catastrophes. But Agile. Agile works, doesn't it? You're all here because you believe Agile works. Okay. Why, why is Agile not better than the others? You know this graphic. You've seen it in a hundred different formats. It's basically always the same one coming back. It's a good idea. It's a good concept. I like the fundamental concept that lies beneath this. But the problem is, is that Agile is by definition team focused. Agile is working within a team or within a group of teams, but it is very localized and it is focused just on doing the team's work. Um, somebody mentioned value flows just now. I'm sorry, I don't remember who it was. I tried to have a look at what would be the value flow of a typical agile methodology. So what does, what does the, the process value flow of agile look like? I have a user who asks for something to their purchasing department, whom I will call customer. The customer then sends this request to the front desk at your business, where it lies for a while. After a while, the front desk realizes they have to do something with it. They pass it on to sales. Sales look at it and gives it to the engineering manager. The engineering manager then passes it down to an engineering team to ask if they will give me some estimates as to how long this will take and what this will cost. Those estimates are given back to the engineering management who gives them to sales, who complains that it takes too long and demands shorter estimates, lower budget. So we rework the estimates, we give this out to sales who passes it down to customer who accepts and then starts defining what are the requirements. Those requirements are communicated back to the engineering manager who passes them to a separate engineering team because the first one is busy now. That engineering team asks a few questions about requirements. This is not always appreciated, so we implement the customer representative to answer those questions. And we start creating high-level design, which gets approved. We create our stories or our specifications, depending on what language you want to use. We create a product backlog. We start planning the release. We create the sprint backlog. We create sprint estimates. We bring all that and finally we are planning our sprint. We are planning our sprint. We do development. We monitor the developments through Scrum replan if necessary, finally get to the point where we can have integration and produce a demo which is presented to the customer. All is well, the customer accepts the demo, so we do a delivery. The delivery is passed on to the customer who hands it over to the user who says, that's not what I meant. What's the problem with Scrum? What's the problem with Agile? Is that you've limited it to development teams. As long as your organization cannot support the principles, you cannot do Agile. You can play at Agile in your corner. I was talking to, to a representative of a British uh, government body a while back who explained to me that their lords and masters, politicians, had requested them, had obliged them to go agile. 
They receive all their requirements at the beginning. They're not allowed any contact with the customer between now and then, and they have to deliver a full final product which corresponds to their plan from the start. In other words, there's no way they can be agile. I said to him, I said, do you really think they understand what agile meant, means? He said, no, of course they don't. I said, well, you manage your project the way it should be managed and write agile from time to time in your progress reports and they'll be happy. Let's solve it. Okay, I believe in science. This is the basic science principle, okay? Not always used by all scientists for various reasons, but the basic concept of science is that you put together a theory which you then actively try to prove wrong. And if you cannot prove it wrong, maybe it is right. But you don't try to prove your theory right. That's a misconcept. Putting this in place, Understanding, if you've never read Tris' great book about invention, the first step in creating a product is trying to understand what all the bits and pieces mean and how they fit together. And you build your product. Okay, I've decided to illustrate this with hardware because it's easier to show than software. So the basic first step, parts for a system, we create something like this. That was a picture of Colossus, the first programmable electronic computer which was built about one kilometer from where I live. The next step is trying to identify, can we improve the bits of this? Can I make the bits, the components better? And so we evolve into something like this. That's what computers looked like when I started working in IT 40 years ago. And then we reinvent it. Now that we've got the principle and it works, can we make it completely different? And so we invent something completely different and it still is working. And then we get to the fourth stage, which is where we are right now in computer industry, where the product is evolving on its own to satisfy its environment. This is a uh, Galaxy Note 7, which can also be used as a fire lighter in winter. <laughs> understanding this and understanding where you are and how to improve things is one aspect. The next aspect you need to understand and you need to study is metrology. Douglas Hubbard was mentioned by a couple of people already this morning. Metrology is understanding measurement and it is understanding what to measure and how to use data efficiently. Great book. The problem people have with measurement is they usually think it's to do with numbers. Measurement is not about numbers. Measurement is providing me with objective data that reduces my uncertainty about a given area. I can do measurement fairly simply and rapidly by asking questions. It's maybe not statistically valid, but I know what I'm getting. I'm getting the response, I'm getting better at this. Another science that I suggest you look into if you want to change the way things is working is agnotology. I admit, I haven't read this book yet. Um, I have looked up agnotology, I've read articles and so on, I haven't got around to the book at this point. Agnotology is the science of understanding what we don't know. So it is working through the cultural blocks, the difference in interpretation, the things that are stopping you from knowing certain things.
And then if you're really into it, complexity. This is taking the, the concept of system of systems one step beyond and seeking to understand how complex life really is and what are the hidden relationships. One solution does not work for all. Okay. I have a, a very strong allergy, number one, to consultants who have one answer, whatever your problem is, they're selling their product, but also something which is rampant in the Agile community are people who believe that every single project has to be run according to Agile methodologies. Not true. Why do you only use one tool no matter how big or small the problem is? Use something that works. Um, I'll be around for questions and answers until 5 o'clock. You can contact me here. Um, oh, one more recommendation, of course. Let's read my book. A lot more of this, where this comes from. Thank you.